Aaron, what up, man? Man, thank you so much for having me on, Dave. It's been a while. No pleasure, dude. This is uh, this is always like a, a good one to get in because it's like friends catching up. We we're just talking for like sure. St. Louis. Like, what made the move to St. Louis, by the way, before we we're talking? So my wife's entire extended family is from St. Louis. That'll do it. My parents still live here. So like we grew up here. Yeah. Um, it's just I've been in Kansas City for the last eight years working, and it was it was one of those things where we were like, all right, it's it's time to move back. We had always talked about it. You just gotta pull the trigger eventually. Yeah. And it's worked yeah. out. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. It sounds like the new clinic you're at. Give a little plug for the clinic and where you are and all that stuff. Yeah. So I work at SSM Health Physical Therapy, uh, which is pretty big in the Midwest. Um, and exclusively in St. Louis, there's a ton of clinics. And right. we are specifically, or I'm at the D1 training location, which is off of Manchester. Cool. And um, it's just a sports physical therapy dream. I mean, it's a it's a smaller clinic, but it's not like your normal physical therapy clinic. I got a squat rack 10 feet from the PT bed. Yeah, um, awesome. You know, we've got a full 50 yards of turf field to run on, you know, in the clinic that I'm at, we're right attached to a D1 training, which for those out there that don't know, they're trying to be a, a big player in the strength and conditioning and fitness fields. They do a lot of stuff with combine training and, you know, um, field and agility tribe training. So we've yeah. got, I mean, out there access to 12 racks, you know, Perfect. prowlers to push lots of fun. It's awesome, man. That's so cool. And yeah, it's funny. So like, obviously uh, I'll, I'll paint the picture for why, like we, I've always wanted to do a podcast with you and we've, we talk yeah. so much work behind the scenes, but I was, uh, I was just like um, with Dan one day, Dan Pope, a good buddy, obviously of both of ours that we're in the clinic and um, something came up about like, you know, I have Mike and Lenny on either side of me, Mike, Ronald, Lenny McCrina, and you have a lot of people you've worked with. I know you've talked with Stu McGill and we have mm -hmm. friends like Dave and Chad. Like, I feel like you, me, Dan, and maybe some other guys our age are like girls too, are like the second generation of like the sports PT strength conditioning mush slash like AT Cairo all coming together. I feel like definitely the Charlie, the Charlie Weingross of the world and uh, <laughs> you know, the Michael yeah. Reynolds of the world kind of mushed us all together. And I don't know, I don't know how you feel about it, but I felt like it was water out of a firing hose for the first five years of like clinician trying to start a side hustle doing a niche practice. And then now I feel like I'm kind of hitting my stride for sure, feeling good about what I'm doing and mentoring. And I know yeah. you are and Dan are. So that's why I came up because I feel like I want to just like shoot back and forth about how we got to where we are. And people ask me a lot. I'm sure you get a ton of DMs. Oh yeah, all the time. How do I do what you do and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. so that's why I came up, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Um, Right now, I would say I'm definitely, I feel like I'm definitely in my stride as well, like you said. So for those out there that are listening to the podcast that don't know sort of the, the humble beginnings of Squat University, um, ever before I became a doctor of physical therapy, I was the strength and conditioning nerd, the weightlifting nerd. All throughout high school, I was one of those kids that while I may not have ever exceeded as well to my athletic capabilities on the field yeah. of play with baseball, football, things like that, I was always that weight room nerd. I yeah. loved lifting, loved everything about it because I felt like I could succeed with uh, my capabilities in the gym far more than I could talent wise on the field. Even yeah. though I loved baseball, I was not meant to be a baseball player. One of those things. So <clears throat> when I got to college, I went to Truman State University for undergrad, which is a small D2 school up in Northeastern Missouri. And that was when Facebook first started. Now you're my age, correct? We're, we're both 34. I'm 31. 31. Okay. So I'm a couple of years. So when you were, okay. So, um, whenever I got to college, that's when Facebook first started. Like that's yeah. when you watch the social network. Like that was my year. Yeah. And back then groups were a big thing. So I get on Facebook, you're trying to connect with different people in your school and you see different groups and I'm scrolling through and it's like iron dog Olympic weightlifting team. And I'm like Olympic weightlifting team. Like, cause back back that time, 2005, Olympic weightlifting, you really didn't see it on TV. Sure. I mean, you'd have to stay yeah. up till three in the morning to see it on, you know, CNBC yeah. during the Olympics. It wasn't <laughs> on prime time. Not that it is any more now during the Olympics, but it's much more visible, especially with the rise in CrossFit. Yeah. So I had done the Olympic lifts in high school through just training. My weightlifting coach, um, we always would do more than just your bigger, stronger, faster programming. Like we did cleans and jerks and stuff like that in high school, mm -hmm. but I had never really seen competitive weightlifting. Yep. So, you know, I was done, uh, playing baseball and football. I actually hurt. I tried to play baseball in college, hurt my elbow during the tryouts, which was a godsend because literally the next week found the Olympic weightlifting team, went to the informational meeting. And I'm like, wait, you're telling me you guys work out five days a week. And then you go and compete on the weekends in a weightlifting like type event. And they're like, yeah, I was like, sign me up. That sounds I'm amazing. I'm in because <laughs> I'm hooked instantly. And I fell in love with weightlifting. And then 
as every single strength athlete out there, regardless of strength athlete sport, every single athlete out there, you're always dealing with some sort of ache and pain, especially yeah. a weightlifter, powerlifter, crossfitter. There's always something that's sort of bugging you. Well, I was not the exception at all. I mean, I had elbow pain. I had knee pain that you know took me out for a month or so. I had back pain, all these issues that would come up. So in doing that, I found the role through exercise science was sort of that physical therapy pattern. That's where I wanted to go and then eventually go to school because I found the joy of what physical therapy could bring a strength athlete, particularly as far as getting out of pain and getting back to what you love to do, Mm -hmm. which is performing the same way in gymnastics, getting out of pain and getting back to doing gymnastics like you love, you know, my ability to experience that firsthand, I think led me to have so much appreciation for the physical therapy field, but then also want to, once I got out of physical therapy school, want to be that person for as many people as possible. So I went to physical therapy school at uh, University of Missouri or Mizzou. And then in that, I was able to, while we're going through clinical rotations, um, I was able to be fortunate enough to be an intern with the strength and conditioning staff there. So not with the athletic training staff, Right, because right. they actually at the time and probably still do, they don't want anything to do with the physical therapist. Uh, anyone who's a prior athletic trainer yeah. in a college setting, the athletes are you that that's your you know group of people. Physical therapists, uh uh-uh, uh, stay out of here. Now, there's right. some schools that are doing a better job of integrating the professions, but there's still a big divide, especially at the college level. Sure. So, we found a good connection with the PT school and the athletic training staff or the strength conditioning staff to say, hey, let us be interns strength and conditioning wise. And then what we'll do is we'll do sort of individual athlete breakouts where I'll do my own screening on a few athletes who we'll call uh, special care athletes. Mm. So they're back with the strength and conditioning staff. They're healthy athletes per the sports medicine staff, but yet there's something still wrong in the strength and conditioning staff's eyes. I'll give mm. you an example. There was an athlete I worked with, super, super fast kid at the time. I think he was a freshman and he had the, in high school prior, had the 100 meter, uh, I think, USA national record in the 100. So I think, I mean, I'm talking like low tens, upper nines, whatever. The kid was super fast. Wow. He had torn his ACL or his MCL the year before, surgically repaired, you know, got cleared by the strength or the uh, sports medicine staff. And I'm doing just some simple stuff during our first evaluation. The kid had like a 70% limb symmetry hop test. Oh my Lord. Yeah. So for those out there without a strength conditioning or medical background, that means with his left leg, he could hop, you know, 70% of what his, uh, good uninjured leg could do. So even though he's cleared by the medical staff, he's definitely not cleared from a movement perspective, from a physical therapy perspective, because he still has big deficits Mm. in the way in which his body is producing power, strength, stability. Mm. He's just set up for a future injury. And he's not going to be performing to his greatest potential. So I was able to take kids like that and basically do physical therapy, but we're on a much higher level Mm. than what you would regularly be doing on a, you know, physical therapy, clinical rotation where you're, especially in the ortho world, doing a lot of total knees and things like that. So, um, then got out of physical therapy school, went to the, uh, Kansas city area. And I started working at a sports clinic called boost physical therapy and sports performance, which has since uh, become part of the Exos world, which is a, another bigger strength conditioning physical therapy company. And, uh, then recently moved out to St. Louis. Now, like you said, what are the origins of sort of how did I become and able to do what I was able to do with school university? Yeah. I didn't start it straight off the bat, just like you. I mean, I didn't get out of physical therapy school and go, all right, I'm ready to speak to the world. And I'm glad, I mean, I always say, you know, hindsight's always 2020. Social media was a very big thing in 2012 when I got out of school, but it's a little bit different now than it was then. Everyone's trying to be a social media star yep. now. Yep. And I'm glad that I did not have the drive yet to try to speak to other people at that time because you don't know what you don't know. And the biggest thing is you got to get and learn from people. So if you're a young practitioner, I'm talking even like a couple years out. I personally believe that it is that time that you need to spend still learning in grooming yourself yeah. and becoming a sponge from the, the rest of the world because there's so much out there that you'll look back on and say, wow, I can't believe I used to do that. Yeah. And, and just in those first couple of years when you're actually getting out there and 
getting your hands dirty, working with patients, you learn so much more than you ever thought you would in school. Not to say I was arrogant at the time when I got out, sure. but I think I, I had the approach of, I don't know what I don't know. So I need to learn. I need to put my head down and work with all these patients. But at the same time, I was continuously trying to learn both scholastically and mm. uh, practically. So yeah. like yourself, I'm a big research nerd. Um, I would print off and I would always anger the the front desk staff at right. my place because I literally go through reams of paper. Yeah. Anything that sounded interesting, print it off, read it. I don't care if it's coming from this journal or that journal, a lot of strength conditioning stuff. But what I do is I'd go down rabbit holes mm. and uh, I'd say, all right, uh, today we're going to learn about, or I'm interested in like hop testing, hop test symmetry. That's an interesting thing because I'm going to hop test this person. Yep. And, you know, someone says, well, what's a normal symmetry? And I'm like, well, usually 90% or above. Well, where'd that come from? Well, let's find out. Let's find an article. Okay. Now look at all the references that that article had and then read those and then find the references that those article referenced mm. and then print those off. So all of a sudden I just had packets and packets and packets of research that I'm reading and then trying to apply that also clinically. And I think that's where the magic happens as far as being able to find that growth and develop who you will become. Mm. And eventually I got to the point where I was writing research for uh, the International Journal of Sports Physical Therapy. And I had an article that was, um, it's using the APRE, Auto Regulatory Progressive Resistance Exercise. Um, protocol with an ACL post-op. So this kid was maybe 15 weeks out and we started doing this protocol of, it's a very, a fairly advanced protocol as far as how far it'll advance. But for those of you out there that have not heard of it, basically the idea behind the protocol is that every single athlete advances their strength at a different rate based on a number of different factors, strength, mm -hmm. prior injury history, things like that. Well, especially during that sort of gray area between early rehab and return to play, there's this time where people are like, uh, do I start loading the barbell? What do I do? Do I dip my toe in the water, see how it feels kind of thing? Well, I was like, let's start using a protocol to systematically get ourselves back to where we wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So it would take a kid, so let's say, I think he was a prior like 400 pound squatter, high school running back, strong kid. And up into that point, we had done like 135 pounds on the bar. And a lot of physical therapists find themselves at this time being like, okay, go back to your strength coach because mm. I don't know what to do with you because I don't have that higher level strength conditioning experience other than just put more weight on the bar, put more weight on the bar, more, more sets of 20 kind of thing, you know? Mm. And the strength conditioning coach goes, well, you used to be a 400 pound squatter. Now you're at 135. What do we do? So this goes, all right, let's meet in the middle. So I believe uh, the first set uh, there's different progressions of this, but there's, let's say there's a, a 10, a six and a three, I think what it is. And you would do a couple warm up sets and then you would get to your working set. And then based on how many reps you do determines what you do for the fourth set. Mm -hmm. So let's say uh, you're trying to do six. You're like, I think I could do 200 pounds for a set of six and you get 200 on the bar. And then you do as many as you can, given that we're not pushing into pain. And we're not compromising technique. Obviously, in physical therapy world, I don't want to see any compromising technique. Right. Well, let's say you do eight. Well, then I go to my chart and I go, okay, you did eight reps. That means for the fourth set, I want to put 10 more pounds on. And then you do it one more time. We do as many reps without pain and with, uh, without compromising technique. Yep. And then based on how many reps you do that time, you go to the chart and you go, okay, next time I come in, I'm going to set my third set, which is my working set. I'm going to start it at this weight. Sure. So it then allows you to sort of auto-regulate based on how your body is gaining strength mm -hmm. to a very individualistic manner. So if some kid is progressing at 10% per week back to his prior level strength or 5% or 20%, it regulates to that so I can be sure. more efficient with my progression. So I was writing that research article and I got done and I'm like, man, how many people are reading this? I mean. <laughs> Besides my mom, who I send the PDF to, <laughs> maybe a few people, you know, how many people am I impacting is what I, is what I was asking myself. Mm. And then I also got to the point where I was really trying to focus on building my own credibility by, by what I thought was right. And that was getting more letters behind my name.
right? And when you're getting out of school, it's like, all right, I need to get this letter and this letter and this certification. Mm -hmm. And up to that point, I mean, I had my CSCS, I had my USA weightlifting certification for weightlifting coaching. And I was like, I need to get my SCS. Yeah. Well, for those out there that know me, I am not the most test savvy person. I mean, I can get my grades, you know, yeah. well where they need to be, but I'm not one of those people that can just regurgitate content for tests. Yeah. Um, so I get to the SES and I, I think I failed it by like three questions. A test I mean, it was, yeah, it was miserable. And the thing too, that, that angered me, and this is a whole nother topic, but I don't feel like answering the questions to that test, the knowledge that was, that they were wanting me to spew out. I don't think that signifies a good sports physical therapist. I would agree. We have this argument all the time and I don't think, I strongly don't think that what the SES is trying to do is good for the profession. It's trying to make you an athletic trainer. And yes. I don't think that the, like, if you want to be an acute care medical specialist, like just get your ATC, but like that test yeah. should be designed to help you treat high level sports things and learn about strength, conditioning and nutrition and stuff like that. Like, which it has pieces of it, but like, man, yeah. you should be funneled down the expert sport, not an AT. So sorry to interrupt. Exactly. Well, no. And I, I also think it, it would have been great to see some like video questions as just like with the CSCS where they're like, and I mean, I remember taking my CSCS and they're like, all right, someone is doing a depth drop and then they're going to do a depth drop to jump. Like what's the next progression in the plyometric chain? Yeah. Or what's this person doing landing wise, wrong movement wise, technique wise. Like I would like to see that because technically a sports physical therapist more than anything else is a strength and conditioning coach. Yeah. We understand movement in higher level plyometric strength and conditioning principles much more than your average outpatient physical therapist in, in my opinion. So either way I get done, I failed the test and I'm like just sitting there and having the, one of those come to Jesus talks. And I'm like, what am I doing right now is I'm trying to write research that probably not many people are reading. I'm trying to get these certifications behind my name to make sort of myself look more marketable. But in the end, does that change who I'm reaching, how I'm becoming a physical therapist? And I was like, you know what? I need to start writing in a way to influence 18-year-old Aaron. And what was I at the time? I was a meathead in the weight room that loved working out, but loved also learning about the body and how I could become a better strength and conditioning, weightlifting, exercise science type person. So I was like, all right, I'm going to start something. I'm going to write a book and it would be, you know, the squat, the most basic movement we could think of. Because up into that time, I started noticing these trends, sort of this deja vu like scenario where every single day when I'm just doing an evaluation of athletes, and I'm talking young athletes, old athletes, I'm talking middle school athletes, high school, college, professional athletes. I'm talking, you know, NFL level football players, Olympic weightlifters, mm. world-class level powerlifters across the range of athletic abilities and scopes of practice. During our evaluation, I would ask them to perform the most simple movement of a squat. Get out of your shoes. Show me how you move. Take your shoes off. You know, let me see how you're moving. And then do a single leg squat. And time and time again, like I said, this deja vu like scenario kept on popping up where these amazing athletes who were even moving huge weight in the weight room were having this missing piece, this broken link in their chain of movement repertoire, which was the basic body weight squat. It did not look great. Mm -hmm. I'm sure these guys could squat 800, 900. I've seen many thousand pound squatters, but yet sitting in the bottom of a deep squat without shoes on, I could see issues. And I think it was because that as a society, we got to the point where we were rearranging our athletic priorities to such a point that we viewed what we did in the weight room as a higher priority than how well we were moving. Right. And Louis Simmons has the quote of a pyramid can only be as tall as it is wide. Well, and if we think of our, our body and our way that we are set up athletically as a pyramid, our foundation should be how well we are moving. Mm our movement quality, which is based on mobility, stability, coordination. Yet too often we have this pyramid flipped upside down where we care too much about skill and power and strength and not enough about the quality and the way in which we are moving. Mm. And I believe that was a major factor for why I was seeing so many injuries from these very strong, well-to-do athletes. It's because a storm blows through and knocks their performance pyramid over 
and they're left with an injury. And I find that the better quality movement that you have, the better your squat looks, mm. it sets you up for not only being uh, prone for less injuries, but it sets you up for having a higher potential for performance. So your pyramid can grow in height performance wise. You can have more strength, more power, you know, more potential uh, performance wise in the weight room by just moving better. Mm. So I was like, I want to start writing a book on this and write it in a way that anyone can understand. Even 18 year old Aaron, who doesn't have a degree in physical therapy. Mm. I didn't want to be one of those people that talked down to others. I want to talk with you at your level. And I felt that my experiences up into that point being a weightlifter and a strength conditioning coach first, and then a PT allowed me to have that conversation much better than a lot of other people. Because I was like, Hey, you know what it feels like when you're trying to pull the bar from the ground and your hip flexor hurt so bad and you got to roll it out like for 10 minutes just to do one more rep. Yeah. I've been there. I know what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Here's let's talk about it. So I wrote like 500 pages, single spaced, right? Cause I still that research nerd. <laughs> And one of my buddies that was working with me at Boost, he was like, hey, man, like, this is way too much. Like, you're writing way too complex, way too, uh, way too long. Let's, let's work on this together. Like, I, he was like, I'm a, I'm a good writer, I believe, and I feel like I can help you in this. His name was Kevin Santana. He's my co-author on the first book, uh, The Squat Bible. And we're like, all right, well, let's, let's start writing this. And we basically broke the entire book down and just started writing blogs. And that was uh, at that time we started writing it and I was like, well, I got to start figuring out how to give this to the world. Mm. And one of my buddies, I told him, I was like, I, I'm going to write this book. And he's like, Hey, you need to, uh, reach out and read these books from Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah, he goes Gary V. He goes, basically the way in which you sell anything today, you have to have brand recognition. You have to be able to create something that people want to buy from. You can't just have a product and say, Hey, buy this. You know, you have to create loyalty. You have to create a brand that people want to buy from mm. because they want your information. They want your knowledge. And I go, that makes sense. So I started reading. I, you know, instantly I bought Crush It that day. Yep. 2000. I think it was his 2009 book. So I was reading in 2015. Yeah, yeah, right hook. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I got that and I was reading it and, you know, he just spoke to me. He was like, if you've got passion, like no one else about fishing lures, you can make a business selling fishing lures to people by telling them everything there is about fishing lures, make videos about how to make them, you know, write a blog on which ones to buy, mm. uh, you know, write out, make a podcast on your fishing experience. And I'm like, holy crap, this guy's speaking to me and telling me in the language that I'm already thinking about weightlifting, powerlifting, being in the gym, how it relates to physical therapy and also being out of pain and performance. I was like, that's my niche. I was like, this is me. So that day, it was like October 9th, 2015. I was like, all right, let's start. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Uh, like the same exact story. This is hilarious. Yeah. Literally the same book. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I started, uh, I made my Facebook page that day. I made uh, my website. I think it was a free one. It's squatuniversity.com uh, through WordPress, free website. Started Instagram. I started a Twitter account. Uh, I don't know what else I started at that time, but basically every, maybe the YouTube channel yeah, yeah. and, uh, just started making content and it was like blogging at first, let's put it in, uh, you know, let's make one blog a week, something small like that. And then let's start making content on Instagram and all this. And it just started slowly becoming what it is. And then Instagram started taking off a little bit more as that was a younger platform. And I started developing a way on Instagram where I could tell stories and give away, free information and people were really enjoying it. And then I started doing things like, like Gary V said, he's like, give away your time, sort of, you know, find the ways in which you can scale the unscalable. Mm. And what I would do, I would make a post and I'd say just words on the screen. Do you need help with your squat? DM me. And the first day I, you know, I got uh, like eight DMs and I would just sit there and I message the person back and I go, Hey John, thanks for the message. Uh, you know, send me a video of your squat. And send it back and I'd go, all right, well, I see like a hip shift on the way up. Uh, try this test. So I'd send him a, either my own blog or a video I'd made or someone else's, you know, and he'd try the test and send it back. So I'm going back and forth with him. I don't know how many times. And this is eight other people. It didn't take a little bit of time. And then the next week I tried it again. And that time I got a little bit more. And I had like 
50 people messaging me back. And then slowly it became to go where I couldn't do that anymore because I was literally getting 100 DMs in like 20 minutes. Yeah. And then I would sit there because at the time I was working four 12-hour days or four 10-hour days. They, they turned to be 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, so I had one day off. So I would sit there on my couch at home for like five hours straight just messaging people back in the DMs. Hey, try this, Jerry. Hey, Susan, that looked like a good squat. You know, try this next time. You know, just back and forth. And what I was doing is creating this relationship with people where I'm like, I'm here to help you. This is free information. I'm not charging you at all. And then, hey, can I use your video for a post? Because maybe there's 15 other people that could have your same problem. And I can make a video on that and then help a bunch of people. And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. Very cool. And that's just sort of how it grew. And you know, now we are sitting here today and oh, things have just grown like crazy. And now it's, there's not enough hours in the day. I saw that 1.5 million on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, just twitched, uh, twitched over to 1.5, uh, this w- or I think two days ago. Woo. Yeah, dude, it's so crazy to hear your story and it's cool. Cause I never actually heard the whole thing from its Genesis, but yeah. you know, like I get, I am sure you get a thousand people who ask you too about like, how can we get to like that platform status? How can we reach? How do you do what you love? And I think there's like three super important things that I think you, me, Dan, so many other people have in common. One is like that early mentorship or that early admitting what you don't know. I think that's really important. I think a lot of young mm. new dads come out and they feel fired up. They're ready to go, but they hit the gas pedal too hard before they have a lot of reps under their belt and they kind of mm. stutter. So, but two is like, you had the humility to, to do that, to realize like, I have to learn a lot of research. I have to read. And that's the most important thing. God, it's so much. It's just work, dude. That yeah. guy, Gary V too. It was like, <laughs> do you have, the, do you have the, the fortitude to sit on your couch and do five hours of DMS, right? Like I remember that too, man, like just nonstop, relentless, like blogs, reading, working, coaching, learning, thinking like nonstop over and over. And people always want the magic form. It's like, nope, it's just a lot of freaking work, man. It's a yeah. lot or it's a lot of Friday nights sitting on the couch reading instead of doing, you know, going out and going to the bar and stuff like that. And like, it's crazy. Yeah. That's like, that's it. That's really it, man. That's like literally my life is squat university and my wife makes fun of me all the time. And I mean, it's one of those things that if you love doing it, like it doesn't feel like work. It's like, can I get more? You know, can I, can I go out and, oh, someone walked away at my last patient. They just got done. All right. Back in my phone, you know, or let me get them on my computer and make this next post. But I love doing it because it's the climb. You know, I just love the next day. What's the next thing I'm going to do? And just, just growing something that's going to be here forever. But in the thing too, is it's having the awareness that really we're here to change the world and we're here to make a mark in the world, the way that we know best. Mm. And I found out at first, it's not about writing research for me personally. It's not about having more letters on the end of my name. I'm never going to go sit for the SES. It doesn't matter anymore. Like I found that I can affect millions of people all over the world by making a 20 minute post, you know, and, and that's really where I feel like I can be the most help to people. Um, yeah. I I feel the same, man, too. And like, definitely from the earlier years, mine started as like a think tank, just like trying to help people. And now mine definitely with gymnastics has evolved and honestly more and more physical therapy now, because a lot of young new grads, I think are really struggling to get a clear message about what to do and how to help. And I, I definitely want to kind of merge into that conversation, but like yeah. mine, I feel has become, I, I enjoy doing it. It's fun. It's so much work, but like, I kind of feel a social responsibility now to gymnastics and to other people that we have a very unique uh, perspective and things to offer the world that I think a lot of people still don't have access to, or it's just like the internet is so noisy right now to get high quality information from people like yes. yourself who are willing to read like 20 hours of research to get down to the bottom of what this actually means for what to do and why to do it versus like the, the guru Instagram, you know, YouTube world of like, you know, elbow pain, one stretch to fix your elbow. (laughs) It's like, yeah, it doesn't really work that way, man. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of noise out there and it, it can be frustrating because, you know, the most you can do is, is know yourself become the best version of yourself and then try to give yourself away. And what I mean by that is when you look at the way in which a lot of people put out content nowadays, uh, there's sort of two ways. They're either trying to 
Uh, sort of like what Gary Vee says, you can build the biggest building in the city by either tearing other buildings down or just building your own up. Mm -hmm. And too often, and I'm talking about strength conditioning, I'm talking about physical therapists. There's a lot out there that just make content that are trying to tear other people down. And I read comments like I'm sitting there. I don't respond to a lot that are on. I mean, I'm never going to respond to someone else's on another person's page, but I see things, yeah. you know, and, and we're definitely in the physical therapy realm. There's this this whole idea coming through that there's no such thing as bad movement. And, oh, did you read this one new research article that came out? Yep. Let's completely dismiss all this research for the past 30 years. And, ah, and then there's also this practical experience of like N equals one. Hey, I did a, and my thing, big thing right now is like the Jefferson curl. Yeah. There's sort of this idea there's like all these people like, oh, Jefferson curls are fine. We can wait those and no one's spines are going to blow out. Your disc can, you know, be fine. I'm like, go, go do heavy Jefferson curls. We're pretty, we're pretty good at pissing people off with our videos on that. Right. Like, I'll tell you that one more than anything, people just, and it's this very small group of people that are like ridiculous. I, I love heavy Jefferson curls. I'm like, do you really, have you really trained them that long? Like, yeah. that's the one thing I think I get a lot of blowback on as far as, you know, saying, Hey, Here's my practical experience mm. in coaching thousands of athletes on how to move better, move more, and get out of pain and the research. Like we don't just de deny all this research because one research article comes out that, you know, says what you think it says. For example, there was a research article that came out recently and had some big name people on that physical therapy wise. And it was like, um, Gosh, what was it about? Low back pain with flexion. And it basically said, should, uh, is low back pain okay? Or actually, let me see if I even have it right here. I think I had it right in front of me because this one would be an interesting thing. Yeah, it's around here somewhere. Bear no, with me. It, it, I'll, I'll kind of like fill in the yeah. here because I completely like feel like looking at like young new grads, what I went through, what I see other people go through, and especially looking at like these mm -hmm. experiences is like so many young new grads are getting. Yeah in the complex, the social media world, the, mm -hmm. the buzzworthy topics. And they're forgetting just like basics, yeah. basic treating joints and anatomy and mobility and strength and just basic loading. And yeah. they completely into the like, I mean, I'm not going to name any systems, but like crazy ass systems of exercise. Like maybe they're valuable, but like if the yeah. person doesn't have basic joint mobility and basic strength, like, I don't know if that's going to be great to start with a complex intervention. And I see a lot of new grads yeah. jack people up because they lose it in the boat. But what were you going to say on the, on the flexion part? So I couldn't find the actual article, but basically what it said was, is flexion okay with lifting? That was like the name of the title, basically. And then if you actually read through it, you'll see it was a meta-analysis of a bunch of studies that did not even include lifting over 12 kilos, which is like 25 pounds. So a lot of people would take this, be like, aha, lifting with a rounded back is okay. And I'm like, aha, no, it's not. Did you actually read the full article? Mm -hmm. Like you cannot extrapolate something like that from something that uses such light loads. Yeah. And I've, I've had the same thing happen on the opposite side of the spectrum with, with PARS defects and fractures and gymnastics. Wow. That where people are like, like the pain science movement of the world was like, ah, spondy on an MRI, like no big deal. Like do press ups anyways. Like you're yeah. fine. Like it's all in your head. I'm like, bro, 14 year olds should not have bone pedicle edema and be, you know, I I've literally had gymnasts come to me who said like, because of the pain science approach, they got manipulated when they had a pars fracture and like, they got so much worse. Yeah. Or they were like, no, just do some graded exposure. And like, as someone who studied all of that stuff when I was younger and I treat a lot of chronic pain patients, mm -hmm. like a 14 year old should not have back pain, right? Like yeah. a, it just, it's not an okay thing to just let go is let someone have a spiny fraction. Like, nah, just like keep working out. You'll be okay. We can, <laughs> it's just not the reality of the situation. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with you. And that's the other, I think probably group of people who that vehemently disagree against the stuff that I try to put out there because I am very much so uh, a fan of the movement based system of approaching injuries and fixing injuries, which is something Dr. Shirley Saruman talked about years ago. And then McGill and then Kelly Starrett. I mean, all these people are talking about, we're, we're looking at movement and this is a biomechanical or kinesio pathological way of understanding injury. And it is very valid. And if I can change someone's pain in one minute by just mo telling them how to move a little bit differently, that shows that it's not up all in their head. Sure, emotions and, you know, the bicycle like I understand, like if you have a fight with your girlfriend, like your back pain may hurt a little bit worse the next day. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that uh, psychosocial issues can't affect pain levels, but it cannot create pain. 
Mm. Pain can only be created by a mechanical problem in the body. Um, and that is the way in which we should address it, I believe, as physical therapists. Yeah. And this is something I've talked to a lot of gra new grads about, especially at Champion, is like, as someone who swung the pendulum so hard all the way from the, you know, kind of biosocial, so I'm going to say it, bio, <laughs> biopsychosocial, <laughs> all the way from there, all the, like, I studied that stuff super hardcore. And then when I met Mike Money and started treating a lot more high level athletes, like, they're more, they're 80 to 90% overlapping more. So like you, I could see the exact same problem and make the argument for both sides. And you kind of pull out whichever one you need more based on the person in front of you. But I'm curious your thoughts on this. I think still the biggest problem that I see in new mm. grads that I had a problem with, is like people just don't understand basic strength and conditioning principles and loading oh, 100% true. Uh, into like a, a uncomfortable, but normal range. And like, I just had a case where somebody came to me with long, like long standing, uh, year long thoracic outlet pain. Like she heard her, she like hyper extended on a skill and like two doctors, two surgeons thinking about a capsular shift and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, dude, she like literally her phase one dumbbell program, like was like yellow therabands and basic mobility work. And she's never had anything more in four months. I like look at all exercise. I'm like, is this hard? She's like, nah, it was never really hard. She lacked 40 degrees of elevation and she had the, like just a super weak shoulder cuff. And I was like, have you no. tried basic flexibility work and strengthening They're like yeah I, I did some stuff but they just gave me like one pound two pound dumbbells yellow theraband lat pull downs for like three months and then like i just did some like basic passive range of motion with like manual therapy and they just rubbed my bicep tendon i was like whoa what yeah. i was like this is crazy and i see so many people that just don't know how to do basic knee strengthening basic squatting hinging push pull you know single leg pelvis like they just don't do a basic four to eight week strength program and they instead just make like crazy looking exercises on like BOSU balls and bands and instability. And like, I guess there's maybe a role for some of that stuff, but like, I don't know. I just think that's still the biggest problem that I see across the profession is a lack of just basic loading, basic orthopedics for your 80 year old grandma or your elite level Olympic lifter coming to you like basics. I think one of the biggest problems in the physical therapy profession is the inability to understand basic loading principles. And to be able to perform basic loading principles ourselves. Mm. If you went to any national conference and you said, everyone stand up, take your shoes off and sit in a deep squat for a minute. I bet you only a few could even do it. A good looking squat. I made a post on Twitter a couple weeks ago where I said, in my opinion, a physical therapist should have the ability to perform a squat, a deadlift and a kettlebell swing. I think those are basic fundamental movements. Now, obviously in America, kettlebell culture isn't even completely infatuated throughout or, you know, mm -hmm. throughout the rest of uh, America, like it is around the, the world, especially like in Russia, yeah. but a squat and a deadlift, those are basic movements, loaded movements. I don't care if you do it with a barbell or you do it with a kettlebell or, or a, you know, holding a weight or doing something like that, but perform that with good quality movement. And I, there are way too many physical therapists out there that don't understand that at all. And I got so much blow back on that because people were like, this is ridiculous. I don't need to know how to be able to deadlift to treat someone's back pain. And I'm like, actually, I think that is your job. I think that is your job to be able to first and foremost, be the pillar of moving well. And I think being able to perform a basic hinge or a basic squat, that is a fundamental movement pattern that if you cannot show the ability to do so under load shows you do not have capacity. Mm -hmm. Now you want to do it with a sandbag on your back. Fine but you should be able to perform a basic body weight squat and then load it and show you know, uh, competency. Mm. I mean, that is the idea behind physical therapy. Our goal is not just to be someone that gets someone out of pain. Mm. Our goal should be able to restore function. That's what we are as physical therapists. We're getting people back to doing what they want to do. And too often, too many people in the physical therapy world nowadays are still ultrasound cold pack Lie on your side and do a one pound dumbbell external rotation. And because we get people out of pain, we believe that we have done our job appropriately. And I don't believe that's the answer. I think it really is. Do we get someone back to functioning and moving as well as possible? I get so many athletes that come to me from other failed physical therapy clinics. And mm -hmm. I said, what I always ask them, I'm like, what, what did your other physical therapists do? And often I'm just like, here we go again. You know, this person back pain. Well, they were just, you know, they'd stretch my back for a little bit. Um, you know, we would do some, we'd do some dead bugs yep. and then we would, uh, you know, uh, heat and stem at the very end. And I'm like, okay, did, 
did you ever get up and you know perform a hinge motion? Like, did did you work on your hinging pattern? Did you do any loaded carries like a, like a suitcase march? Did you do uh, did you do any bird dogs? I mean, even a bird dog is more functional than a lot of things I see. And they're like, no, not really. I I haven't done that in, that hurt before. I'm like, well, let me show you how to do it correctly. Does that feel good? And they're like, oh, yeah, that feels good. I'm like, this is proper physical therapy, getting you back to do things. I mean, because sure, you can do all the dead bugs you want. But the second you get out of the clinic and you have to go pick up your baby girl out of the crib, you don't know how to hinge. Your back's going to go out again. Yep. You know, we need to be able to think about how we're doing physical therapy on a very different level. And I think every physical therapist, now I understand those out there. Someone's going to always chime in and go, well, I work with neurophysical, you know, neuro patients and spinal cord. All right. I understand there's many types of physical therapy or I work with lymphedema. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> I'm talking to the 99% of us that are in the ortho world, which is yep. the vast majority of physical therapists out there. I believe they would benefit from taking exercise science courses or having continuing education and learning just proper mechanics on lifting and, you know, loading schemes. Yeah, no, I mean, I completely agree. And like back to like the, you don't know what you don't know. I remember like starting to learn from Mike and his courses and like, like realizing like, oh, I need to know a lot more. But then when I actually started getting mentorship from Mike and Lenny, like mm -hmm. for me personally, like it's still, it's still impressive. Maybe this is a college level education thing or not, but like, they didn't really, t I don't think they taught us like really specific in-depth anatomy and biomechanics to what the joints we were seeing. Like I had never heard anything about capsular mobility testing by different interior bands or inferior bands or middle glenohumeral ligament stuff, testing of different cuff exercises, stuff like that. I didn't get any of that, like very specific anatomy. And when I started to master the anatomy of the joints and really understand like what the surgeons understood in terms mm -hmm. of shoulder and now with hip, I do quite a bit of research there and stuff like that. Like that was completely eye-opening for me because like a good eval gave me the insight to see things that other people hadn't about soft tissue versus capsule versus that. And then secondarily, like you said, do you know how to get a knee joint, just basic knee strength back after post-op surgery? Do you know about patellar mobility, quad strength, hamstring strength, the, the stem loading, basic squatting patterns, hinge, whatever it is. And then from mm -hmm. the just basic periodization, just do you know how to do basic linear periodization with squatting, hinging, stuff like that? Like those three things alone of knowing the anatomy for an assessment, getting a, a knee joint or a shoulder joint like calm down based on what you what you can do with therapeutics stuff like that mm -hmm. and then knowing how to restore a basic body weight strength program like those three things alone if people just focus on that and therapy i think would be so much more ahead of the game but instead what you yep. have is uh, a lackluster active range of motion one plane of motion passive range of motion real quick some pendulums some one <laughs> bells uh and a little bit of you know basic therex and then like okay your six weeks goes by and you probably just have natural chemical inflammation resolution because your body did its thing and you're better. And then they go out on their way and they, they get hurt again or something goes worse. And it's like, I don't know, it's terrifying to see sometimes what people are doing for, for therapy when they come, I don't mean to knock the profession out. I want people to kind of get tough love to get better, but it's just really sad to see how many people fail PT because the, the approaches we take are half an assessment and some really crappy exercises in the corner. Yeah. I mean, I, again, like you said, I don't want to be one of those people that's knocking PT as a profession because that's who we are. Yeah. <clears throat> but it is one of those things that I, as much as I want to be optimistic, I just get way too many examples day in and day out of people that go to other physical therapies, that physical therapists and have bad results, not because of anything they did, but because of the way in which the physical therapist treated them. Now, obviously there are good and bad in any profession. So um, it's, it's tough to say because the physical therapy profession is growing like crazy. There's so many people in our, in our profession nowadays. Um, but it's something that I, I think we need to point out, not tear others down, but point out where we need to make improvements so that we are aware of the issues as well. Yeah. Um, and that's also, I mean, one of the things, so I'm, my second book, I'm, I'm almost getting ready to release it in January. Coming out um, soon. <laughs> thank you. So um, it's designed, I wrote it to be sort of the go-to book for athletes and coaches that are having in injuries in the gym. So, you know, you're a, an avid weightlifter, a power lifter, a, a gymnast, and you are dealing with some back pain. So you turn to chapter one and you go, all right, here's sort of the anatomy behind how back pain develops. 
uh, because there's many different reasons. Try these tests. Okay, based on these tests, this is the type of back pain that you're dealing with. It's a flexion intolerance. And -hmm. then based on that, here's the first couple steps that you need to take to get out of pain and then how to progress back to high level lifting again. So I wrote it more so for anyone who would ever walk into a weight room. Mm -hmm. Well, in doing so, I do believe this is sort of my way of doing physical therapy that I think any physical therapist or a student who wants to become a physical therapist could also benefit from as well because it's basically my approach to physical therapy much more than the squat Bible was. Um, And I feel like hopefully that will be uh, a springboard to hopefully allowing others a little bit of insight into the way in which I treat, which hopefully, I mean, it is something that hopefully can be uh, a game changer for the physical therapy world as well. Yeah, I totally think it will. And I'm excited to read it. I think I, I want to definitely button up this part of the conversation with like advice to people. Cause I know we're like, yeah. to, like, you know, cr- crash on people, but not give advice. And for me, yeah. personally, I always recommend that people save their money up and buy the surgical textbooks or buy the complicated textbooks. But also I got asked on a podcast a couple of weeks ago from a new grad. She's a third year. And she's about to graduate. She was mm-hmm. like, you know, what would you recommend? Like SCS, you know, or what courses, what manual therapy courses, like what's the best thing you ever took in your physical therapy education? And I was like, no. Yeah. My CSCS, going to Cressy's and watching a webinar. Yeah. Like, you know, going to Boyle's and listening to what they had to say. The best thing I ever got was not a physical therapy manual therapy course. It was a basic strength and conditioning course academically. And then going and clinically shadowing and watching people like, how do you coach a deadlift on the fly? What do you do when a squat looks like crap? What are your cues? What are your progressions? What are your basic progressions? How do you build a four week program and get somebody better? That was way more helpful to me than anything I learned in my physical therapy degree. So that that's my advice is like buy books, read the geeky stuff the surgeons do, but also Mm -hmm. hang out with strength coaches to like get better as a therapist. But I don't know, what do you think people should do in the, in the noisy world of social media where they're like, I have no idea how to treat somebody. For sure. I would say learn from those who have come before us that are the giants on the hill, that we are just mere dwarfs sitting on top of their shoulders. Mm -hmm. So uh, Stuart McGill, first one right off the bat, an easy book that you could read in a weekend is Back Mechanic. He wrote it again for the lay person, which I hate that name. (laughs) He wrote it for anyone to understand. But go get that, read it. It's not very expensive. Uh, I on another level would be movement. So anyone who's a young physical therapist from Gray Cook and yep. Lee Burton and all those guys, read movement front and back. That's another great book. Um, and then Kelly starts becoming a supple leopard. Yep. Like all of those together are sort of my top three books that I felt were pillars in my early education. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you know, find the person that you want to be like and you like to learn from, and then absorb everything you can from them. So like Kelly Starrett, when I first was a young physical therapist, that's when he was still doing his mobility wide 365 days in a row of a a video a day. I watched every single one of them. Yeah. You know, I completely, that's what I would spend my Friday nights sometimes, uh, was literally just video after video after video and just taking notes. And then, uh, you know, listening to Gray Cook, Every single podcast he was on, I would listen to those and just sort of absorbing as much as possible. And then, like you said, going and shadowing people, you know, I I think sometimes depending on the world that you're living in, if you don't have a lot of money to go and shadow Eric Cressy, Eric Cressy puts out a crap ton of blogs and videos on YouTube for free. So there is no excuse to not know what Eric Cressy teaches on this because it's all out there. So, you know, learn, 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 immerse yourself in the world that you want to be in and it will allow you to grow in a way to be eventually become who you are meant to be yeah no i agree i think that's a really good kind of summary point is if you're trying to learn the geeky stuff master the joints know about different bands of shoulder ligaments and learn about Mm -hmm. you know meniscus or cartilage injury stuff that's really like what you're seeing you should go towards the research the books the text like the, the the really nerdy stuff but if you're looking for more like people skills, global movement, strength conditioning. Like there is strength conditioning journals. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But like learn how to coach on the fly and the soft skills of like working with people and knowing good movement patterns, like all that kind of stuff. You should be willing to invest the time and the money and the effort into, you know, their courses or they're just reading their blogs. Like you said, are going and shadowing. Like that's how I got my job at champion was I was, I was yeah. studying the SES and I was like, I've never seen a UCL injury in, in a, in a baseball player. So I need to do it. Like, Hey, Mike, can I come and shadow? I had bought a bunch of his courses and read all of his stuff and took his, mm-hmm. like, you don't have the money, just read the blog stuff. But like, I just developed relationships with like Urson back in the day and then Lenny and then Mike. And I just wanted to soak up as much as I possibly could. And eventually they were like, Hey, we think you're like doing a good thing. Like, 
you want to work champion? And I was like, okay, I'll do that. But there like, I, same thing as you, man, Friday nights, Saturday nights, five o'clock in the morning, reading research before I go to yeah. the clinic. There's no other answer besides you have to grind and you have to sacrifice if you want you have to sacrifice time and money and effort if you want to be a master of your craft. True. Very, very true. Yeah, man. So uh, kind of moving on past that point, what are the other big things that you see? I think we talked about strength and education, something like that. What are the other like big rocks you see, not only in our profession, but in like the the mixture of like AT, Cairo, PT, strength conditioning people? Like, What are the big problems that you see still are like things that you wish if you had a billboard and a magic wand and you can put one, you know, do this. Like, what, what do you think are the big issues that we still face as a professional? Man, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think the big thing is not speaking before you have practical experience in, in performing that or seeing that happen. I mean, yeah, way too many times people will start trying to speak to the world and social media posts. I'm like, uh, dude, have you ever used that technique? How many people have you even used that with? I mean, what are your outcomes with that? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, day in and day out, the grind tells you whether or not this is a valid way of doing things. Yep. Um, I, I think that's the biggest thing is getting your hands dirty for a long time before starting to speak to the world is a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's actually really interesting is, um, a lot of new grads now are kind of on like the cash based therapy. They want to jump right into one-on-one -on -one treatment stuff, but it's like, we actually tell people like, no, you should work in an insurance based setting to see a ton of people. You should try to get your hands, like you said, get your hands dirty with, you need to see it 500 shoulder valves before you start making suggestions about the best exercises or evaluation treatments. Like, you know how many knees and shoulders Mike and Lenny have <laughs> worked on it with Kevin Wilk and James. Yeah. Andrew? Okay, like legends in the field before they ever wrote a blog post, before they ever suggested a course. Like they work on same thing with me. I probably worked for like five years before I started having like really like medical things to say. You know what I yeah. mean? And just like coaching is a different story because I was still coaching for 10 years, but like yeah, yeah. I didn't start talking about like treating label tears and <laughs> so I was like five to seven hundred people deep and like reading all the research of years and years. So like People are, I, I think people are really trying to ride the buzz wave of social media and they're trying to get Insta famous first before they have high quality, long hours of experience. That's true. Now, here's another thing I just sort of popped in my head. This is for the physical therapy profession. And I guess it's sort of along the lines of things that we could do better. Uh, if you're a new grad, you should not be a manager of a clinic or be in a clinic by yourself. So, this is for a lot of physical therapists who find a job with, you know, outpatient clinics. Where they're just like, all right, so you're going to go head up this clinic over here. I see it just way too often. I don't know if maybe it's more in the Midwest that I've seen where physical therapists get out of school and they're like, oh, I took a job with this company. And they, you know, within six months, they made me a manager over at this yeah. clinic. And I'm yeah. like, what are you doing? Like, you should not be in a position of leadership for years. Yep. I don't care if you have great coaching leadership or you're just a good, you know, you have managerial background skills. No, like you should be learning. You should be, you know, that's a subordinate to someone much higher level for a long time because you're there to learn. You're not there to spend your time managing. Yeah. Um, and I think way too often when you take a position like that, sure, you may get a little bump in pay raise or something like that, but you're cutting your legs out from underneath you as far as your ability to continue growing as a physical therapist, because then you're worried you're all by yourself often, or you're in the position of leadership. So you're the person that knows the most at that clinic, you know, uh, or assumed to know. Uh, I think it's very difficult to continue your learning at that point. Yeah, absolutely, man. Super well said. And uh, I don't know why I just came up with this. I want to take like a hard, sharp turn in like the topic conversation because I feel like- Let's do it. Uh, people, then the question, there's a bunch of questions that came in, but the one I picked yeah. particularly is like an overlap. But I don't know. I feel like people also are sometimes pitting, not pitting, but like comparing you and me together in terms of like what works for the gymnast versus the weightlifter and the Jefferson curls, and like all this kind of stuff. And <laughs> the question is perfect. It says- yeah. Can people with hip dysplasia, all types learn to squat properly? Is it impossible for some drills, please? And I thought this was perfect because like I, hip instability and hip dysplasia is like my pocket, right? Versus you're probably more in like the FAI squatters hip. And mm -hmm. so I'm curious to know, I guess more so like that question, but then like your approach is to super hyper mobile people and not just like the stiff power lifter, but like the people like me who could like bottom out of squat super heavy and have super mobility and might get into trouble with you know, opposite ends of the spectrum of too much mobility and loading too fast. I don't know. I've never asked yeah. on that. So I'm curious. Yeah. So that's a great question. So being in the world that I'm in, I sort of see both sides of the spectrum because as you know, there's a lot of different types of hips out there. Now, this is something that I first learned from Dr. Stuart McGill with his research and looking into different 
types of hips as far as the depth of hip sockets. Now, uh, looking at the research, there's a lot out there, and I've listed a couple on my website and a couple different blogs, but there was a couple uh, huge analysis uh, research articles that looked into the rate of hip dysplasia across the world. And what they noted was uh, different countries, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, uh, had higher incidence of hip dysplasia than those like uh, Ireland and Scotland. And uh, McGill referred to them as the, the Scottish hip, so the very, very uh, deep hip socket. And what he also noted from his experience in this is that where do some of the best weightlifters in the world come from? They come from the Eastern European block type countries, you know, uh, Poland, uh, you know, a bunch of those uh, countries around that area have very high rates of hip dysplasia and coincidentally also produce some of the best weightlifters in the world. Now, weightlifting is unlike powerlifting in that weightlifting in order to be as efficient as possible, you need to be able to drop under that barbell and get as low as possible in your receiving positions. Mm. So weightlifters, especially the ones that make it to the very, very highest levels, are often very hypermobile people. So I think to a point, the dysplastic hip can be a, uh, a very helpful thing as far as allowing more freedom of movement. Um, there's a, a couple of people um, in the U.S. actually that I had seen that literally could sit their butt on their heels in the bottom of a, of a deep squat. And actually, yeah, um, there's a, a few people, I won't bring up their names, but that they could, they were actually getting red lighted in uh, competition because their butt would touch the ground. Wow. You know, and that's, that's a very, very deep squat. Uh, so those people have different challenges to them as far as how to approach the sport. But I believe just like being a gymnast, um, you first and foremost have to have the platform foundation of a lot of mobility in order to then exceed. I believe that it takes someone much longer or they just have a much diff more difficult road if they come from a more uh, stiff as far as their joint mobility. If they have a more uh, deep hip socket, they're mm -hmm. not going to be able to squat as deep. So they're going to cut the reception as far as comparison to someone with a more diplastic hip. Um, and they won't be as efficient in their lifts. Now in certain sports that can also affect pulling power as far as Miguel has been, uh, educating others on. And while you may have a more difficult time pulling that weight off the floor, as soon as you cross the knee, man, that's where your power comes in. So yeah. oftentimes, you know, certain types of style of powerlifting deadlifts, that person may be very, very strong. Mm -hmm. um, and can succeed performance wise. But I think I see a lot of sort of both ends of the spectrum. Like you said, I see a lot of hyper mobile, uh, weightlifters because the good weightlifters are often extremely mobile in the hips. And then we just have to understand, okay, what's that? Let us know. Just like in, uh, gymnastics. Well, we got to work on techniques. Got to be amazing. Stability has got to be there. I don't need to spend my time doing a ton of mobility work. I need to work on my control of the mobility I do have. Yeah, super well said. And it, and it kind of paints the picture of, I guess, the the other thing that you and I kind of have a, a, a discussion back and forth on. And a lot of people mm -hmm. almost will call out together. It's like the spinal disc mechanics too between gymnastics and weightlifting, right? Like I mm -hmm. on my podcast, we had a long discussion about the goal of your programming, your training, and how based on, I think, predisposition for sure, like the hip socket depth will maybe funnel you into a different, just like height. I'm not going to be a basketball player, NBA anytime yeah. soon, right? But also too, like, somebody might get born with a broader, flatter, you know, spine to handle more compressive loading versus a gymnast in my department, if they're especially a high biting scale, might have a more flexible, less spinous process angulation so they can bend more and hyperextend. Mm -hmm. They're going to push towards that hypermobility. And it's the same thing with like the disc mechanics that is an entire like two hour podcast in itself. <laughs> If a gymnast is born with a more hypermobile collagen makeup and can bend more, they probably don't want to be conditioning the disc for super high level power lifting and gritty oh, yeah. collagen. Vice versa, if you have a, a lifter who's going to try to get top end deadlifting or powerlifting or Olympic lifting stuff and they need that compression force, it's probably not great for them to do hypermobility based exercises. Like we do a lot of flexion to create the shaping that we need, whereas you might not have a great, like taking a bunch of weightlifters and doing a whole bunch of gymnastics V ups and moving flexion motions probably might not be the greatest idea ever because of the ad adaptations we're trying to place on the collagen and the disc and stuff like that. And I know we're about to get a thousand emails about how <laughs> wrong and how, how dare I say that, but like, it's about sport specificity. You can't be a super high level top end strength athlete and also be a super hyper mobile gymnast and expect something not to break in between. 
Exactly. It all comes down to context. And you and I are really having just the same discussion on different levels of the continuum. Right. And if you are trying to excel and be the best in the world at a sport that requires you to be very hypermobile, you're probably also not going to be able to load a ton of weight and tolerate a ton of compression like a power lifter would. Yes. You know, it, it's very different ends of the spectrum. And the way in which you train, you are trying to pull out specific adaptations out of that person so that we can pull out the best performance and mm -hmm. have sustainability and longevity in that sport as possible. Now, obviously, there's going to be people that sort of meet in the middle and they're going to be the rarity. But often we find when we're speaking sports specificity in working with the best athletes in the world, when I'm trying to talk to someone about driving a Lamborghini, we don't give them the exact same you know, tips on a Honda. You know, we're, we're trying to give them the exact same tips as, as far as how to fine tune that Lamborghini because it's very specific yeah. for a high caliber machine. Well, a power lifter, their goal is to load as much weight as possible onto their spine. And what we know is that the body performs well and has sustainability if that spine is not moved with load. Yep. It all comes down to the idea that power should not be generated at the spine. So power equals force times velocity. And force is the amount of load that is being placed on the body. And velocity is how quickly that area is moving. So if we take a gymnast doing any type of movement, there is very low force relative. Obviously, when they're landing, there's a good amount of force, but relatively lower force and a lot of velocity sometimes. Whereas with a power lifter trying to pick up 900 pounds, there's a lot of force, but their job, therefore, is to lock the spine and not have as much movement relative, mm -hmm. which then therefore keeps power low. Yep. Now, in the same sense, if we were to flip that and take, say, uh, someone who's trying to swing a golf club with a 100-pound uh, club, obviously, you're generating a ton of power at the spine. The spine's only going to be able to tolerate for so long before it starts breaking down. Yep. Now, some people always raise the question like, well, what about the spine adaptation? Well, the spine adapts to very specific ways of loading it in a way that can keep it healthy long term. Mm. And you can't go against the basic rules of biology, which is if you are creating a lot of power long term, that's not going to be sustainable. And time and time again, research shows us that if you create power at the spine, not at the hips, but at the spine, it eventually delamination occurs or specific loading properties where we're maybe getting uh, pushing towards those spondy issues or having a lot of excessive force on the pars interarticularis. You know, that's where injuries occur. Yeah. So if we keep power low, let's have a lot of velocity. If in, you know, very minimal force and we keep power low, we have a lot of force and very minimal velocity. We're having the same discussion. We're just talking from different ends of the spectrum. Yeah. And this goes completely back to what we talked about with why you need to know your anatomy, because if you look at the collagen makeup of the 45 degree population, like it's not built for high rotational power forces, but also there's spinous process, you know, there's um, facet joints that block extended range of motion. It's going to make sense of why it's not really made for high rotation. And I do want to say that while you can't adapt to the ends of the spectrum, it's not to say that gymnasts shouldn't do some strength training and weightlifting because, Oh they, yeah, not, yeah say that weightlifters or powerlifters can't benefit from uh, some body weight conditioning. I know very good friends of mine who are Olympic lifters at a high level who have done gymnastics. And mm -hmm. I preach that gymnasts should change the entire culture and start using strength conditioning, but you can't maximize both sides of the spectrum at the same time. You know what I mean? And so yes. I just want to make sure I, I kind of have that up before again. A hundred percent. And for example, the same thing people always say, well, you know, we're saying don't ever bend the spine if you're a powerlifter. That's not what we're saying at all. Because again, context, I love using movements like the cat camel or cat cow moving the spine. We're just not under load. If you're going to pick something up, let's start to brace the core and limit spinal movement. And yeah. then you'll also get people, again, this is another discussion about those who read a little bit of research and can understand a little bit, but yet don't have the wherewithal wisdom to understand full context of what we're talking about. There was a research article that showed that uh, the spine flexes at very specific segments during a squat or deadlift. They took uh, some high level uh, weightlifters and powerlifters and they had them perform a high bar and low bar squat and a deadlift. And they put sensors on their back and they saw 
that during just this 70% weight that there was movement of the lumbar spine and they go, ha ha. Now these athletes are some, you know, they're showing great technique and the spine's moving. So given the cue, lock your spine, don't move it. That's ridiculous. The spine always moves under load. Well, if you actually read the research article front to cover, you would see that the spine, while it does have a small amount of movement in certain areas, also creates three-dimensional adjustments in the different segments above that specific area that they were looking at in the research article so mm. that the spine stays as a whole within the neutral zone. Mm. So what we say when we give the cue, lock the spine and don't move it with a deadlift or a squat, we're not saying that no movement ever exists, but we are minimizing the amount of movement so that overall the vast majority of movement occurs at the hip joint. Right. We're trying to create stiffness and stability. And sure, while a small amount of movement may occur, it's not going to exceed the amount that would push past that neutral zone mm -hmm. that is the ideal way to load the spine and then set someone up for eventual injury. Yeah. And just to button it up, the exact same argument comes from my world and like the hyper extension of like overloading facets, whether it's weightlifting or gymnastics is there's a difference between uh, braced extension and slight movement and not having the hip mobility to extend or the thoracic mobility to extend and literally putting massive amounts of overpressure onto facet joints and the pars when it's not designed to handle that well. So it goes both ways, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm super conscious of your time and I know you're a busy man, but I wanted to leave the last couple minutes to well, I've just vomited like a thousand questions. <laughs> I, I wanted to give you the opportunity if there's things that you ever were curious about from my world that you, you know, had questions about, but also just to give you a little plug for the book and when you can find stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the discussion of, of spinal mechanics, um, especially when it comes to both of our worlds, because especially the extension, um, like you mentioned with, uh, with weightlifting extension is also something yeah. that is is very prominent in the pulling movements you know yeah. you see a lot of extension and i think a lot of people uh they almost believe that we are saying to fear movement and to create mm. this fear and it's it's no it's what we're doing is we're educating people on how to move well and understanding the mechanics behind the way in which you're moving and loading it either set you up for good performance or for eventual injury. And when it comes to specific movements, especially sports specific, there are going to be things that exceed what most people believe are people are capable of athletes are capable of. And it's because it's very sports specific, you know, being able to sit in the bottom of a snatch with those arms completely locked out, you know, a little bit of extension that, you know, looks like something that is very uh, difficult for the vast majority of people to get into. But when you're real, working with a hypermobile athlete, it can be very safe given the time to adapt to it. Just in the same way you see some of these positions that uh, gymnasts get into, you know, we're not fearing movement. We're understanding the adaptation that has allowed them to get into that position. And also that person isn't doing 500 pound deadlifts on the weekend. Right. Right. You know, absolutely. And I think this is a, a perfect way to button it up is I think people have like from Chad and from Dave at power monkey, which we've really learned a lot from is like, you have to remember that what you're seeing at the surface level is literally the product of, I mean, I think I did my first muscle up when I was six, I mm -hmm. did my handstand when I was four. So wow. like you have to realize like how many years of, of gymnastics training have done over and over for Dave Durante to do what he does. And same thing with Chad. Chad has probably done barbell squatting since he was like, you know, a very young age and he's adapted yep. to it. Like for him to be able to do some of those things took 25 years of progressive loading. Think about how many cycles of adaptation he's gone through on his spine, on his hips, on his shoulders to mm -hmm. do some of these things. And I think the problem is people see the end result and they think, well, this is an end that applies to me. So I can just dive into that kind of stuff. They don't realize like, okay, what you really have to do is go back and start 20 years of work and then work your way up. And then we can have a discussion about why is this one Chinese lifter internally rotating or why <laughs> is one gymnast doing this ridiculous hyper extension over and over again? Like, oh, that must be dangerous. It's like, no, it's a slow adaptation over hundreds and hundreds of cycles. Exactly. I mean, you're talking about the Chinese lifters. I mean, the amount of people that I get say, well, uh, you know, so-and-so lifter allows his knees to cave in on the ascent of a squat. And I'm like, you realize you're talking about China who has millions of weightlifters within their federation. And if this guy has a little bit of knee pain, eventually, first off, there's another person right up there that can replace him. Second thing is to understand that like, this is first and foremost, an elite, elite athlete, a who's trying to go for a gold medal. You are not his body has been genetically predispositioned to be in that level, to be able to tolerate some of those forces. 
uh, yours has not. So we cannot allow someone's uh, falter with their technique at world level weights to justify your poor technique because yep. it's not going to end up great in the end. And then also understand that a lot of times the videos that you see from some of these amazing lifters, they're only their best lifts. Like they're not showing you their 60% warm up. Yeah. So you don't even, most people, they never even see these athletes warm up. I've seen so many behind the scenes videos from Lou Zhaojun. Like the guy uses immaculate technique 99% of the time. Then all of a sudden you're going to see his one extremely 300 kilo squat and see his knees cave in one time and go, see Lou's knees cave in. So it's, it's not a bad thing. And I'm like, you didn't watch the 30 other squats he did up until 300 kilos. They almost all of them looked amazing. Yep. He did one squat with 300 kilos where his knees caved in a little bit. None of the other ones did. The guy's knees are probably going to be okay. But people will take one of those different, you know, one clip and they'll try to justify why it's okay to have poor mechanics. Again, this is something that I see too often with those who are very, very in like sort of the pain science world. And they don't believe that bad mechanics can lead to, lead to pain. Well, yep. sure, we have to understand context again and exposure time. Because people that use that issue and they say, well, see his knee cave, that's okay. A, that's a one-time exposure. It's not happening that often. And especially in the amount of lifts that he's doing overall, it's very, very minuscule. Um, if you're using that to justify why it's okay for you to have knee cave during your 60, 70, 80%, well, that's where the breadth of your training comes in. Yeah. Now you're having a lot of exposure time after time. Your body tissues have a set biological tipping point for what amount of load they can tolerate before pain and injury tissue disruption occurs. Mm -hmm. And the quickest way to reach that is to use poor mechanics and load the body. So again, there is a reason that we develop injury yep. and yep. we cannot use someone else's problematic squat at 300 kilos to justify why it's okay for you to continue lifting that way. In my opinion. No, I completely agree. And I think, Again, the vast majority of people don't understand, appreciate, or have the discipline and the work ethic to do the super boring basics every single day. And the, an example I always use from Powerman Camp, and I love her to death, mm -hmm. I can say this is Jess Lucero when she was first at camp. I watched her do a 30 minute warm up, soft tissue activation, all that kind of stuff, a 30 minute empty barbell work, a 30 minute light snatch technique session. And then she went heavier on snatches. Then she stripped it down and went back to lower technique, cream and jerks. They all looked amazing. Yeah. Perfect right? They look they, flawless technique. Watch, watch some of the elite level gymnasts for a four hour practice. I bet 35 to 40 minutes of basics and warm up 35 to 40 minutes of event basics. Again, conditioning at the end, perfect hand, like everything. It's just meticulous over and over and over. Like who, who puts in that work to do two hours of basics every day? Yeah. And I, I wish more elite athletes showed that. Yeah. And showed that whole, like getting to the gym and doing the soft tissue work and doing the open barbell work because I think it would lead a lot more of the average everyday athletes like myself, you know, that aren't elite to understand that, well, if they're going to take that much time to focus on the fundamentals and basics, maybe I should too, because we get too many people nowadays that think that walking into the weight room and grabbing the barbell and doing a few squats with the open barbell is enough to warm up. And it's not. It's far from that. Now, sure, if you're moving well and often throughout your day, you're going to be more primed to not need a very long warm up. But the little things matter mm -hmm. in doing the things to set your body up to handle the load and not just handle the load soft tissue wise, but coordination wise. That's huge. Yep. Going through the small things to make sure that your your glutes are turned on, your stability's here, your mobility in your left ankle is is symmetrical to your right. And we get the barbell and then we're doing a couple minutes of just open barbell work to make sure that we're moving well and coordinating everything. And then we're starting to load. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't need to be a, a 50 minute warm up if you don't have time. 10, 15 minutes is going to be much better than nothing. And not only are you going to be moving well and performing better, but you're going to decrease that injury risk because you're priming your body to be able to handle those loads. Yeah. If I had five people all lined up and a couple of them are going to, warm up well for 15 minutes and the other ones are just going to grab the bar and start going long term let's see which ones are still performing without that achy elbow or that sore knee or that bum back yeah 
because I promise you the ones that are taking the time to warm up well are the ones that are going to have that sustainability. And that's what it's all about because yeah. the more sustainability you have in whatever athletic avenue you're trying to do, whether it's the gymnastics or be in the weight room, you know, sustainability allows you to reach your performance pinnacle because you have that much more time to be under the bar, time under tension, that much time to learn your craft mm -hmm. because you don't have that achy elbow, that achy back taking you out and making you have to miss quality reps and quality days. Yep. Super well said, man. Perfect time to end. <laughs> I could talk to you for hours. This would be like a three hour discussion. But <laughs> Agreed. Great. I, I love I love actually being able to have like a long in depth discussion. But um yeah, on parting thoughts. And obviously, Squat University, people can find you. But when did the book come out? Where can people find it? The whole jazz. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Squat University, I'm all across every social media platform you could think of, even TikTok. Ooh, um, yeah. I'm <laughs> yes. there. Yeah, man. Um, uh, let's see. The, the book is called Rebuilding Milo. Um, it comes out January 19th. It is the uh, pinnacle of my physical therapy practice delivered to people. Uh, in a way that is easily digestible in ways in which you can empower yourself to take the first steps to get out of pain and back to performing, especially in the weight room. So I'm talking to anyone who loves lifting. We're all dealing with aches and pains at some time in our life. This is the way in which you can take those first steps to understand why your body's hurting and get out of pain when you don't have a good physical therapist to go to. And the only thing advice that you've had is either we'll just keep on pushing through it. It's normal to have back pain after deadlifts. It's not. Or you go to the doctor and they say, well, just stop lifting so much. Take this pain medication two weeks off. Maybe you'll feel better and go on back to it. We can be better. We have to be better. Rebuilding Milo is the first step in allowing that and giving the independence back to the individual to take those necessary steps uh, to do what they love to do for the rest of their lives. So, uh, it's a big book, 480 pages. Ooh. Um, yeah, man. Uh, it's going to walk people through, uh, back pain, knee pain, hip pain, shoulder pain, elbow pain, um, all issues that would be common to the, uh, weight room goer and, uh, allowing them to just find that empowerment again. Awesome, man. Dude, I absolutely love it. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we'll have to definitely do this again in a part two once the uh, for sure emails and social media blow up about all the things we said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, dude. We'll take it easy, all right? All right.